significance of earthquakes in the past and in the future. Obviously tonight we're going to consider this subject from a biblical perspective. Christadelphians are a Bible-based group who believe that the Lord Jesus Christ will shortly return to the earth. We believe that God is working in the earth today, just as he has throughout history. This includes politically. As it is stated in Daniel 4, the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives them to whomsoever he will. We also believe that God uses the environment to accomplish his purpose. We believe that God has laid out for us in his word, the Bible, the history of the world and prophecy. And around about two thirds of the Bible is actually prophecy. And this makes the events we see happening in the world around us today exciting and significant when we see them fulfilling Bible prophecy. So tonight our class will be structured as follows. The significance of earthquakes in the past that God has used to accomplish his purpose. The significance of earthquakes in the future as prophesied in the Bible. And then importantly, how does this affect you and me? So the significance of past earthquakes. Well, it is estimated that there are several hundred earthquakes occurring somewhere in the world every day, and that major earthquakes happen more than once a month. So you could, quite, you could argue conceivably that they are of re relatively little significance. Our job tonight is to examine not the significance of each and every single earthquake that occurs in the earth, but the biblical significance of one or two past earthquakes. It says in the Psalms that God uses the natural elements to fulfill his purpose. This applies to earthquakes as well as other natural phenomena. For a clear example of this, come with me please to Acts chapter 16 and we'll read verse 26. Acts chapter 16 and we'll read verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. So here we have Paul and Silas who have been imprisoned and an earthquake occurred which released them from prison. Not only were the prison doors opened but their chains and their stocks were loosed and this led not only to them eventually being officially released but also to the belief and baptism of the jailer and also all of his family, his household. So we find that in the Bible record, significant events in Jewish history have been marked by earthquakes. An example of this is the giving of the law of Moses in Mount Sinai in Exodus chapters 19 and 20, when Israel first became a nation. And then perhaps the most significant in, his in the history of the world was associated with two earthquakes. Firstly, there was an earthquake at the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then another at his, earth, at his uh, resurrection. Now, earthquakes have also been used by God as a means of judgment. For example, in Numbers 16, at the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, which led to them being swallowed up in an earthquake as an immediate judgment on their wickedness. We also see in scriptures that earthquakes are used as part of the symbolic language of prophecy, particularly, particularly in the book of Revelation, for example. The prophecy concerning the French Revolution in the book of Revelation, chapter 11 and verse 13, as symbolized by an earthquake, being a major political upheaval in history, the impact of which is still being felt today. This is not unique in the Bible, of course, we see this symbolism used quite often in the media as well. And recent, headli uh, recent headlines have included things like Trump quake, which I'm sure needs no further explanation. And another one from earlier this year, the first round of the French presidential elections marked a political earthquake. So we've seen that earthquakes can be used to accomplish the purpose of God they can be used to mark significant events in history. They can be used as part of God's judgments and they're used to symbolize major political upheavals. So before we move on to the 
Bible's prophecy of a future earthquake, I'd also like to consider a period of time that was characterised by a succession of earthquakes. This was also a prophecy of our Lord Jesus Christ, assisted in the working of God's purpose, was part of his judgments, and a major political upheaval in the history of Israel. This is the time of the first century in the lead up to the destruction of the Jewish Commonwealth in AD 70. Come with me please to Matthew 24, verses one and two. Matthew 24, verses one and two. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one, here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Here we have the context for the chapter. Jesus tells his disciple that the temple, the very centre of Jewish worship, would be completely destroyed. The disciples naturally, naturally ask him in verse 3, when will this occur? And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus goes on in the rest of the chapter to give a series of signs that would be able to see in the world around them and know that the time of the temple's destruction and the end of the Jewish age would be approaching. In verse 7, we see the particular sign that we're looking for. For nation shall rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. The prelude to this end of the age and the climax of God's judgments on the nation of Israel for their disobedience and rejection of his son would be characterised by earthquakes in diverse places. And if we look back in history, we find that this was the case. They occurred all over the Roman Empire, which included the land of Israel, in the lead up to AD 70. In Luke 21 verse 11, which is a parallel record, we also read that great earthquakes shall be in diverse places. History books tells us of these earthquakes, and here are just a few examples. We had Crete in AD 46. We had the day that Nero was named the heir apparent, an earthquake in Rome in AD 51. In AD 53, there was an earthquake in Ampia in Phrygia. It was so bad, bad that they were, they were declared to be tax-free for five years. In AD 60, there was an earthquake in Laodicea in Phrygia. And in Campana in AD 62, Pompeii was largely destroyed. 70 years before, uh, sorry, 17 years before its final destruction. And that earthquake triggered a tsunami so great it hit Ostia, the port of Rome. So just as our Lord Jesus Christ prophesied in Matthew 24, the end of the Jewish age was inevitable and, to, and came about exactly as predicted in AD 70. The Jews did not know when it would happen, but those that listened and believed our Lord were prepared and ready for it when it did come, because the signs that they were given. We can expect this, to see the same accuracy of fulfillment in all other prophecies in scripture concerning the future of the earth. So let's look at the significance of future earthquakes. Times of overthrow at God's hands in the kingdoms of men are preceded by earthquakes as signs and warnings, just as we saw at the end of the Jewish age. Thus, the time of the end of the Jew Gentile times will also be expected to be marked by earthquakes and other environmental disturbances, which I'm sure we're all well aware of. And this has already been the case and will we believe be with greater intensity in the future. This will reach a final climax in a great earthquake centred on Israel that will affect the whole earth. An earthquake that will bring about God's judgments on the nations, help to accomplish his purpose and bring about an enormous political change in the ushering in of the kingdom of God to replace the kingdoms of men. This earthquake will be of enormous impact and magnitude and will not only be a physical shaking of the earth, but represent a political upheaval, the like of which has never been seen before. Earthquakes are our focus for this evening, 
But if you look into the passages we considered this evening in more detail, you'll find that they also speak of things like volcanic activity, tempests, hail, and all manner of natural disasters are spoken of. This earthquake has been prophesied in the Bible as happening around the time of the Lord Jesus Christ being revealed in the earth again. It is referenced in several, part, uh, several parts of the Bible from which we can begin to build a picture of this time, generally known as the Battle of Armageddon. We will not be covering the military side of this battle this evening, and this is a whole other subject in itself. This earthquake is just one aspect of what will occur in the earth at the time of Armageddon and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 16. Here we find the only place in the Bible where the actual word Armageddon occurs, although there are many passages that refer to it. If we have a look in Revelation 16 and verse 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon, and verse 18, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since there were men upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. We see here an earthquake prophesied and linked to this time of Armageddon. The word Armageddon is Hebrew and means a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. Armageddon is thus not the cataclysmic doomsday event that will destroy the earth, as many believe. Instead, it is the time of God's judgment on the nations of this world for their evil and their corruption of his way. It will be the time of World War III and the time of God's intervention to save his people, Israel, from destruction and to bring about the establishment of his kingdom on earth. Joel 3 describes this for us. If you'll turn there, please. Joel 3, verse 12 and 13. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, and the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Note the very similar language to the meaning of the word Armageddon a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. There is the valley Jehoshaphat, which is a name which means the judgment of God, and the language of harvest and thresh threshing. And again, verse 16, the Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. This time is linked with an earthquake, associated with God's intervention, all nations gathering together in war, as we see in verses 9 and 10. <coughs> Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, let the weak say, I am strong. So when will this occur? Well, verses 1 and 2 of Joel 3 indicates that it will be some time after the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem is brought again. In AD 70, we saw that the Jews were scattered all over the world and banished from their land. They did not return as a nation until 1948, when the state of Israel was declared, and they did not regain control of Jerusalem until the Six-Day War in 1967. As this prophecy has clearly has not been fulfilled since those dates until now, it must be yet to happen in the future. This is a prophecy, ladies and gentlemen, for our day. Armageddon will be the time of the end of the gentle, Gentile domination over this earth. All nations will be gathered in Jerusalem for war, and God will intervene and judge the nations, save his people Israel, and this will be associated with a great earthquake. This earthquake, while bre referenced briefly in a number of passages, two of which we have considered already this evening, is described in our reading for this evening in Zechariah 14 in much greater detail. And it's this passage that we'll now consider, if you'll come there with me. Zechariah 14, and straight away in verses 1 and 2, we see that it is talking about the same event as Joel 3. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, 
and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Note the language of verse 1. The day of the Lord is the same as Joel 3 and verse 14. For the day of the Lord is near. Again in verse 2 we see that all nations will be gathered against Jerusalem to battle. And in Joel 3 verse 2 we find that all nations are gathered into the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is the valley of the Kidron, a narrow glen which runs from north to south between the Mount of Olives on the east and Mount Moriah on the west. Perhaps the most detailed prophecy of the Battle of Armageddon is Ezekiel 38. This is often considered in detail in our public lectures, so we'll not be explaining it this evening. But we note in Zechariah 1, in verse 1 of Zechariah 14, that the spoil of Israel will be divided. In Ezekiel 38, the invading armies of Israel are accused of coming to take a spoil and to take a prey. Zechariah 14 is very clearly a prophecy of the time of Armageddon, as we can establish just from the first two verses. Verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. We see that the Lord going forth and fighting against those nations. This is the Lord Jesus Christ is God's representative. At this point, Christ will have already been revealed to the faithful. The resurrection and the judgment will have occurred and we are coming with those who have been deemed faithful and have been granted the gift of immortality. In verse 4, we see his feet standing upon the Mount of Olives. And his feet shall stand on, in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall, there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. This gives us a direct link to Acts 1 and verse 11 which is the time when Jesus ascended up into heaven. His wandering disciples were told by two angels that appeared that this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And verse 12 tells us that they were standing on the mount called Olivet when this occurred. Just as he left the Mount of Olives and went into heaven, so he will come and stand on the Mount of Olives again. And verse 6 of Acts 1 tells us that this was on the apostles, what was on the apostles' mind when they were told this, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. So when Jesus' feet again rest on the Mount of Olives, it will be a time when he makes himself known to Israel for their redemption. So just to recap what we've seen so far in Zechariah 14, this chapter is speaking of the day of God's judgments, which we know to be Armageddon a battle that will involve all nations in the land of Israel specifically and specifically the city of Jerusalem. The Lord Jesus Christ will return with the faithful who have been given immortality and intervene in this battle and will stand on the Mount of Olives. It is this, at this point that the great earthquake occurs. Ezekiel 38 and verse 19 describes it as a great shaking in the land of Israel. Joel 3 and verse 16 says that the heavens and the earth shall shake. And Revelation 16 and verse 18 describes it as a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Zechariah 14 verse 4 describes the effect of this earthquake upon the land of Israel. We see that the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. Rotherham's translation says it will cleave asunder. The ESV makes it particularly clear. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the Mount shall remove northward and the other half southward. So an enormous valley will be formed running from Jerusalem to the Jordan Valley. Ezekiel 38 verses 19 to 21 tells us that the immediate effect of the earthquake will be the destruction of an army led by Gog 
on, and his forces on the mountains of Israel. <clears throat> Those that survive the earthquake will annihilate each other in mutual slaughter. We also see that this earthquake will affect the whole earth to the point where every wall will fall flat to the ground. In verse 5 of Zechariah 14 we read, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Here we see that the Jews flee from the severity of this earthquake, which will have the benefit of distracting God from his oppression of the Jewish people. The word to is in italics, so it is not from the original, and this should actually read that they will flee from the valley, i.e. the valley created by the earthquake. Azal is a name that can mean either very near or the holy place. Either interpretation indicates that the valley formed by the earthquake will reach right unto Jerusalem. Verse 5 also tells us that God will come. We already saw that this is Christ representing God. And all the saints as well. The saints are those who have been given immortality at the judgment immediately following Christ's return, which again is a subject for another evening. Zechariah 14 verse 8 shows us more significant changes that will result from this earthquake. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. Jerusalem is to be elevated and a mighty river will flow from it. Part of it will flow towards the former sea, which is currently the Dead Sea, and the hinder sea is the Mediterranean. These streams will be perennial, a perennial spring, and will not depend on the rain or the seasons, and they will form a vital part of worship in the kingdom of God, and they will heal the Dead Sea. Since both Joel 3 and Ezekiel 47 indicate that the flow of the rivers of Zion will be in an easterly direction initially, it follows that the Jordan and the Dead Sea will be raised over 500 metres by this earthquake. Otherwise, the waters could not reach the Mediterranean. The tomorrow part of that, the second part of that uh, map, shows a cross-section of the dramatic elevation of the land, the Dead Sea and the Jordan Valley. Verse 9 of Zechariah 14 shows us that God will be king over all the earth. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. We know from other passages that he will give his kingdom to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will reign over all the earth for 1,000 years. Verse 10 says, All the land shall be turned as a plain. The RV, or the Revised Version, has that the land shall be turned as the Arabah. Now the Arabah at present is the depression of land in the Jordan Valley. And this statement shows that all the land south of Jerusalem will be changed from its current hilly state to form a vast depression or plain. This will accentuate the position and height of Jerusalem, which will appear greatly elevated in consequence. This will be from Geba, which is 10 kilometres north northeast of Jerusalem, and to Rimmon, which is 50 kilometres south southwest of Jerusalem. The verse goes on to say, It shall be lifted up. This is Mount Zion, which is to be elevated to dominate the whole country. Consider Psalm 48 verses 1 and 2 for a beautiful picture of this time. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north and the city of the great king. The entire city of Jerusalem will be a temple city and will occupy a much greater area than at any time in the past. Mount Zion will be the centre of this house of prayer for all nations, which is described in detail in Ezekiel chapters 42 to 44. Zion will then be a blessing rather than the curse as it has been in the past, and it will be, a sa it will be safe and at peace. This is a picture of what Mount Zion looks like today. Not much to look at. Currently it is lower than the Mount of Olives, but after the earthquake, 
it will be much higher. And this is a picture of an artist's impression of the prophecies of Ezekiel regarding the house of prayer for all nations, which will be set up on Mount Zion. This will be a time of peace and joy, where everyone on the earth will, be, will desire to worship God, a time of righteous rule, and a time when the poor and needy will not be oppressed. Verse 16 of Zechariah 14 describes this time. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So the Bible prophesies a time in some considerable detail, the earthquake that will result from it at the time of the Battle of Armageddon. Just to summarise, the earthquake will basically serve three purposes. The destruction of the invading armies on the mountain of Israel, spread massive destruction throughout the earth by a chain reaction of seismic disturbances, and result in dramatic alterations to the topography of the land of Israel and probably of the whole earth. So what does science have to say about this? Is an earthquake of unprecedented magnitude afflicting the whole earth likely or even possible? Well, it actually seems that we are overdue for an earthquake of this nature. In the last few years, there's been a reasonably regular headline coming up in the news something along the lines of the big one to come. Scientists generally seem to anticipate that a massive earthquake is due for the earth. Consider these headlines. Regarding the San Andreas Fault, which is a continental transform fault, transform fault that extends roughly 1,200 kilometres through California, forming the tectonic boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. And the article says, the big one will be deadlier than thought. A massive earthquake could plunge parts of California into the sea instantly. Scientists believe the big one is now overdue to hit California. That's from the Daily Mail in March of this year. Scientists warned that a giant quake building under South Asia, from sciencealert.com in July of last year. Researchers have found evidence of a huge earthquake building below Bangladesh, considered one of the world's most densely populated countries. Israel prepares for a major quake, Israel today, 12th of June of this year. Israel is making preparations for a major earthquake that is expected to hit Israel in the coming years. Life on the fault lines. Major earthquakes overdue and no one in the world is safe, an expert says. This is from the 27th of August of this year on news.com.au. High magnitude disasters are overdue along some of the planet's major fault lines and there's no way for us to stop them. These headlines are all within the last year or so. As you can see, there is a, a recurring theme. All are different fault lines, yet all are expecting a major earthquake in coming years. The world, it seems, is long overdue, not just for an earthquake, but for a mega quake. This is supported by that article which, with the final headline on the screen. The article goes on to say, a series of overdue high magnitude earthquakes is expected to strike at any moment along some of the Earth's major fault lines, an expert says. UTS geotechnical and earthquake engineering senior lecturer, Dr. Bizad Fatahi, said no one on the Earth is safe from the looming natural disasters of potentially apocalyptic proportions. Interesting use of biblical language there. He goes on to say, there are a lot of magnitude six plus earthquakes overdue in the Middle East, India, China, Japan, and the US. Dr. Fatahi told news.com.au, there are some fault lines that have not released their energy for a while. There are at least five to 10 that are overdue, but we don't know when they're going to happen. And the question is not, will they be activated? The question is, when? So experts agree that there is a major earthquake to come over on all the major fault lines. The only question is when will it occur? The whole world is going to be affected when this happens, just as God predicted in his word, the Bible. The choice we have is whether we will be among those who face the devastation of this earthquake or we'll, whether we'll be with those with the Lord Jesus Christ that rest their feet on the Mount of Olives 
and pre pre prepare to bring about the glorious age of God's kingdom upon the earth. Just as we saw the increase in earthquakes and other environmental disturbances in the lead up to the end of the Jewish age, we can expect to see the same increase in the earth today as God prepares to shake terribly the earth at the time of his judgments on the nations. It is interesting that the word earthquake that we considered earlier from Luke 21 refers not only to earthquakes on the ground, but refers to a commotion of the air, a gale or a tempest. Think of what we've just seen in the last few weeks, hurricanes in Texas and Florida of unprecedented severity, devastation from floods throughout India and massive earthquakes in, Mes earthquake in Mexico. Climate change is blamed for the severity of these, of these events and these forces. And just as scripture tells us, God will destroy those who destroy the earth. He will use the weapons in his arsenal that no man can stand up to. God says in Job 38 and verse 22 that the snow and the hail have been reserved for the day of judgment. Job himself says in chapter 21 verse 18 that the wicked are like the stubble before the wind and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. Remember Armageddon was a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. God's storm will carry away the wicked like the chaff of the threshing floor of Armageddon. But our hope is for the rainbow beyond the storm. This is the message that we want to leave you with tonight, friends. Yes, the judgment of God will be poured out on the earth, but the violence, immorality and godlessness of this world cannot be allowed to continue. God will use the natural environment to accomplish his purpose, but the real message is one of hope, one whereby we can escape these judgments to come and look to a future of peace and righteousness, of equity for all, a time where the environment is restored to what it should be and the government is just and righteous. Consider a moment Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 from the New American Standard Version. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. We pray that we will be amongst those with our Lord Jesus Christ in that house of prayer for all, na all nations, the temple in Jerusalem, teaching the whole world about God and his purpose with the earth. The Bible in Numbers 14 and verse 21 tells us what the purpose of God is. But as truly as I live, saith God, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. That is a prophecy that has never yet been fulfilled, but one that we can be part of, and one that will be fulfilled very soon, we pray. Amen.